despite the Republican Party's best efforts to defeat her, Christine O'Donnell is now their candidate, whether they like it or not. And today I had the incredible good fortune to have the opportunity to interview the last person who ran against Christine O'Donnell in Delaware for the United States Senate, a man who defeated her by approximately 30 points. I sat down with Vice President Joe Biden this afternoon and I asked him straight off about Christine O'Donnell. Mr. Vice President, thank you so much for your time. Well, really I'm delighted appreciate to this. Be, I'm delighted to be back with you. Um, the Republican nominee for your old Senate seat in Delaware is not longtime Congressman Mike Castle, but rather uh, Christine O'Donnell, who you have run against in the past. Um, her own party has derided her as unelectable to any office, and they, in fact, ran robocalls that called her a fraud. It's a very surprising result. How do you explain that, that vote in your home state? It's hard to explain. First of all, there are, uh, we're a single congressional district state. We're a small state, only five smaller. Uh, 185,000 roughly Republicans uh, registered in the state of Delaware, closed primary. Uh, she got roughly, uh, what, 25, 28,000 votes out of 50,000 cast. Uh, I'm confident that the Republican folks out there really thought there was a shot here and they showed up. I think, Mike, if every Republican had a vote, Castle, I think, would have won 130 to, to, to 50. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is that um, it's real tough for the Republican Party. It really, they've kind of hung on a shingle. You know, no moderates need apply. It's, uh, and it's sort of spawns a, uh, I don't know, a, a tone in politics that is uh, not helpful um, to getting things done. And we're, and we're a moderate state. Uh, we, and we thank God we have a really first-rate candidate. This guy is solid. He is honorable. He's incredibly well-educated. He's done a great job running the largest county. They end up with a AAA bond rating. They, he's paid all the bills, eliminated the deficit. This is a really solid guy. And so that's the good news for us. The, this has been... Um a very fun and easy year to be a pundit, because as a pundit, you only have to say one of two things. You either say, boy, those Democrats sure are lucky the Republicans people keep uh, picking these unelectable candidates, or you say, those Democrats sure are unlucky, they can't compete with all that enthusiasm on the right. Now, you and, and the administration obviously can't affect who Republicans choose as their candidates, but what is your role? What do you see as your role in terms of trying to enthuse the Democratic base? Well, first of all, I think the two premises are both correct, are both incorrect. One is that I, I wouldn't sell short these candidates. I think that in my state, uh, this new Republican candidate's going to have uh, an awful lot of money. I think you're going to see it pouring in in these third-party operations that are going to probably spend more money than both parties in some states are going to be in there. So I think they're going to, I think uh, we're going to take advantage very, very seriously. It's a big mistake not to take it seriously, number one. Now, number two, what I'm doing, I've been into over 80 congressional and Senate and gubernatorial races, uh, and one of the reasons I want to be on your show is to tell the progressives out there, you know, get in gear, man. First of all, there's a great deal at stake. I've been around the Senate a long time. We fought to regulate tobacco. We fought for hate crime laws. We fought to make sure that kids get insured. We fought for all the things that we finally got done in one year. And they're all at risk. If they take over the House and the Senate, don't kid yourself. They've made it really clear. Pete Sessions said, they're, excuse me, Congressman Sessions, when asked what they would do if they took over the House, he said we'd have the exact same agenda. And look, th th there's a lot at stake here. And, and our progressive base, you have, you should not stay home. It, you better get energized because the consequences are serious for the outcome of the things we care most about. And I didn't mention half the stuff we've gotten done. You know, look, it's, I think when Barack got, uh, and look, this is one exceptional public figure. I mean, Barack Obama is, this guy is amazing. But to think about it, um, I think there was, he, he did so well, won so big, I think a lot of people thought, well, man, it's just gonna, like, fall out of the sky. Right. What he brought out of the sky, down to earth, were really significant progressive goals that have been met. More to do. More to do. And so I think it's time for our base to say, hey, man, take a look. 
He's, this opposition is for real. Why hasn't that happened organically? I mean, we're looking at numbers now that suggest that Republican turnout in the primaries is outstripping Democratic turnout yeah. in the primaries. That's the most concrete measure you get yeah. of enthusiasm, people willing to take time out of their day to go vote yeah. and do it. Why do you think that hasn't happened organically? I, I tell you, it's hap not happened organically for, for two reasons. My grandpa used to say, people don't focus on the general election until after, uh, after the World Series. It used to be in early October. The truth of the matter is a lot of people are hurting. A lot of people are angry. A lot of people are worried and frightened, and with good reason. I mean, as much progress as we made, there's so much more that has to be done. And so they don't want to make a choice now. They haven't focused on a choice. What they've focused on is the people in power, their dissatisfaction with more, not more progress having been made. But here's the deal. Remember, you're too young, but there used to be a mayor of Boston. His name was Kevin White. And they asked him in his second run for election, you know, a tough question. He said, look, don't compare me to the almighty. Compare me to the alternative. Don't compare me to the almighty. Compare me to the alternative. People haven't wanted to make that choice. They don't want to focus yet. They don't want to. It's like, I don't want to be bothered. I'm angry. But they're going to now watch them starting the beginning of October. They're going to focus. And the alternatives are stark between a Democratic-led House and a Democratic-led Senate and a Republican-led House and Senate. And I've been saying all along, Rachel, I know I've been getting beat up for saying this, we are going to retain control of the House, we are going to retain control of the Senate. Because when the American people focus on the alternative, it's going to be absolutely clear to them there is no alternative. And I really mean that. I really mean that. I believe that with every fiber of my being. When the American people start focusing on the alternative, start focusing on what it would really mean to vote for this slate of Republicans this year, the vice president says they're going to vote for Democrats. The vice president speaking with me today uh, at the Secretary of War suite uh, in the executive office building, in case you're wondering what that fancy room is. Uh, that, that confidence that he expressed about Democrats keeping control of both the House and the Senate today, that confidence was also stated in almost the exact same terms by White House Press Secretary Robert Gibbs. The White White House says Democrats are going to hold both houses in this year's elections. They know they need to get Democratic voters to actually care about the election and turn out to vote in order to do that. Coming up next, the vice president tells me exactly what Democrats and the administration are planning on doing to get their voters out. Can it's wait. a black and white it's issue. That's something that the administration is going to go to the map yes, for. Yes, absolutely. More from my interview today with the vice president of the United States. Ahead.